that's going to be our next single. It's going to get played all over Triple J. It's an eight-minute song that has barely any vocals. And uh, that ship sailed anyway. Who gives a fuck about Triple J? Said like a true old, crusty old man that never got played on there. Yeah, who needs them fucking pop radio in 2020 anyway? But if anyone's from Triple J out there, yeah, play us. Yeah.
And welcome to the Rift Crew. I'm your host, Steve Mitchell, and it's been a while since we've been in the realm, but uh, I am back, and uh, we're going to be back with a few more shows, and this is going to be a, a massive show, I can promise you that. And joining me all the way from DC is, of course, uh, my lovely co-host, Skull. How are you doing, Skull? Hello, ladies and gentlemen in Cyberland. This is Skull, broadcasting from the past, present, and future in the Chamber of the Cosmos, here with my good friend, Steve Oz. I'm in off and on again, DC bomb rock band, uh, Black Manta. I've been in the DC scene for 30 years, know a lot of people all over the scene, and I've been invited to fill in for Andrew for a while, and I'm uh, really excited to be here. So, and we have a special guest, as you said, Steve, it's very exciting. Yeah, all the way from New York City, Ross the Boss, Ross Freeman. How you doing, Ross? It's an honor to be here, my friends, Mr. Skull and Steve. Thank you for having me. And and straight off the bat, I want to talk about not <laughs> pardon the pun, given you're in a batting cage. Um, I want to talk about this album, of course, uh, uh, Born of Fire uh, came out last year. Is it obviously everything that's happened in the world over the last uh, eighteen months? Some of the, some of the music that was released last year might fall through the, the gaps, but I got to say, um, this is in my top five albums of last year. <laughs> one of one of the best uh, metal releases of the year. Um, yeah, talk it up, mate. Well, you know, came out March 6th, 2020, AFM Germany. Uh, we had a lot, so much hopes on this record. We put a lot of work into it. And uh, we had a full tour lined up in April, that April, April 2020. Burning Witches, all these bands opening up for Ensemble. Massive tour, bus tour. You know, we got off the road uh, January. February 24th was the last day of my U.S. tour in uh, uh, Live Nation, Philly, okay? And then we had a couple of weeks to ourselves and we went on tour. Five week, uh, five, eight days later, the shit hit the fan. Yeah. Everything hit the fan. I mean, so we have this record that we think is so great, such a beautiful record, and no touring. No touring. And, you know, it's like, Damn, yeah, it's how it's how the world is right now. Everything did, like it just like a switch went off. Right. Yep. And the switch went off on it, and uh, that massive tour has been like uh, schedule came in. So we have it have it for next May. Unfortunately, uh, Burning Witch is not going to be there. But uh, trauma will be there from I think they're from California, so it's whatever's working out. But you never know what's going to happen in the next year. So, but uh, we love the record, uh, Maiden of Shadows, you know, Glory to the Slain. So many great songs on that record. I mean, every to me, every song is an anthem on it. Um, I, I just I don't know what to say. I mean, it's just been it's 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 so it's so frustrating. On, on, on our part, because we put so much work into it, but everyone is frustrated. You know, the whole world is frustrated. So I'm oh, like, yeah. I, you, know, I, you know, I mean, I mean, as a musician, as a touring musician, that I, that's been touring since 1975, you know, I, I, I consider myself lucky because I have another business, you know, and it's doing well. But so. Things are kind of slowly getting back to normal. So, I, don't I mean. Know. There's, there's, there's some, some group that wants to keep everybody locked down and everybody under the thumb and everybody, you know, there's some, some group like that, but I'm not, I don't see it. I, I don't see it. I, I, I think we should get out, you know, do the right thing. And, and be together. Well, yeah, I mean, there's like, even just here locally in DC, like, you know, be like the Eagles are touring and, and the stones are touring. So, I mean, it's, that's a kind of an, an indication that, I mean, I know for Steve, uh, Australia has completely locked down, but in the States, they're kind of easing up a little bit. There's some, you know, they're easing. So that, that's well, a there, good there sign. Are and, I, and I'd like to send out my uh, respects to Charlie Watts and his family. Oh, yeah. That we, Steve and I were just talking about that. So that's a huge, huge deal, huge loss in the, the rock, you know, rock industry. So good old Charlie, the timekeeper. The best but, pocket uh, drummer, him and Ringo, best pocket drummers ever. <laughs> pocket guys, total pocket guys, amazing drummers. Drummer. 
best drummers. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add about that album, Steve? I, I just like to say, because, you know, obviously, Rasta Boss, you know, uh, is often uh, associated with Man of War and Power Metal. And, you know, for the lazy reviewer, they'll say, oh, you know, the new Rasta Boss album is Power Metal. For me, it, it, it's a disservice to call it a Power Metal album because there's so much going on. And to me, it's just a classic heavy metal album. And even, you know, if we get more specific, classic New York heavy metal album because you listen to the mm. riffs. Um, right. It's just all, that old school New York vibe. I mean, what are yes. your thoughts, Russ? I mean, you look so hard on it. I mean, when you got, you know, God Killer, Born of Fire, Shotgun Evolution, I Am the Sword, Denied by the Cross, you know, Fight the Fight. I mean, you know, Made in the Shadows, you know, I'm Dying. We have so many great songs on this record. And I told, uh, you know, I ordered my singer, ordered Mark Lopes. I said, dude, every song has to have a, a, a memorable chorus. And I don't care what you have to go through to get it. Every song has to have a memorable chorus in it. Otherwise, I'm, I'm turning it down. We're not going to use it. And he goes, yes, Captain. Yes, Chief. No problem. OK. And if you notice, every song has a memorable chorus. And they said, that's the way you write songs. You know, and I've been, you know, I've been in this business for a long time. And, you know, it's just a uh, you know, you, you get you go you go with the mentality that every song is a hit, right? That's right. Just make I think so. Every song you have to be able to repeat in your head. Every song has yeah. to come back at you. You know, there's so much metal and rock that just just goes washes over. You mm -hmm. know, washes over the stones, washes over the beach. That doesn't get counted. You know, because it's you're not hearing it. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes time to the chorus, bam, bam. Right. Bam, I fucking remember it. You know, like when Emerald goes, bam, you know, it's like, that's the fucking deal, bro. You have to remember the choruses. Right on. The chorus cool. is what you remember in all these songs. You know, The Who, Led Zeppelin, uh, The Beatles, Cream, every, every group in the world, you know, The Beach Boys, The Kinks, Buddy Holly, everybody in the world, The Rolling Stones, The Beatles, everybody. Everybody has choruses, and you have to. Mm -hmm. it, has, it has to be memorable. And I, I, I guess you're fortunate uh, that you've got a guy that can deliver, because there aren't a lot of guys that can sing like Mark. Mark, uh, I chose Mark. Um, well, you know, for, for his physical prowess, for his voice, for his durability, and then you know, I really was so sure how he would work. But he did a great job, I mean, a really great job on this record. Uh, by Bloodsworn, the album before um, Born of Fire, he did an incredible job on this. And I said, you know what? You're very, uh, you're very, very creative, and I really appreciate it. And this is just the beginning, and uh, you know, so uh, you know, he delivered, he delivered, and and in a short time, too. You know, when you're under the gun with, 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 with uh, you know, deadlines, 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 especially with the Germans. When you're working with Germans, you don't fucking <laughs> around with the Germans. You don't fuck around with deadlines. Better be on time. Better be on time or they're going to fucking do something to you. You know, right. Ach, Achtung. You know, <laughs> they're very, very, they're very, very cool guys in AFM. But, um, you know, work so hard and all of a sudden, the air. The air gets pulled out. Of, you know, it was so it was so de so deflating. It really was. But but I said I tell the band, I said because I'm I'm I've been around the business for a long time. You know, I, th I put my first record out in 1975. The potatoes go broke right there. Okay, it's hanging in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I said, dudes, my brothers, don't you worry. Greatness is its own reward. Greatness is its own reward. You know? Right on. It might seem bad now. It might seem dark now. But we will see the light in the end. And those songs will see the light. Because people take notice of these things. You know, it's like the, 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 the heavy metal buying public, the rock buying public, they're not dummies. You know, they're not right. dummies. You know, and. What, uh, well, as, as you mentioned, you know, you've 
you know, we, as we know, you've been in uh, the scene, you know, you've been in the business a long time. You want to, you want to just uh, give us a little brief intro, a little history about how you got into the scene, how it all started, how the mat, you know, the magic of the first album, how you met up with the uh, Pearl, Sandy Pearlman and Murray Krugman and, and that just, yeah, just, just, just give us a little background there. Okay, like how you, how so, you guys started and all that. All right. So, because uh, you guys, you guys were really young, right? Super young. We were eighteen. You're 18, right. 19. Yeah. So nineteen. So I had my high school band that I had joined. It was called Total Crud. Believe it or not, it was like a hippie jam band, some sort of an operation. We used to do MC Five songs and it's nice. playing songs and like we Grateful Grateful Dead jams and. You know, we would just play everything because I could play. I wear my MC5 shirt, the true testimonial. <laughs> and uh, I would, I would, I would be able to jam for hours and not repeat myself on guitar. And you know, like people would say, "Well, that's all the story." So then, then, so this band would play all these. We would be up in New Paltz, New York, and we'd be playing all these colleges. We had a house, and they called it the Out of It House because everyone was just, you know, everyone living there was just like the, it was like the. Belushi, where, where he lived, and that did kind of that insanity, you know, when you're going to college. And, and uh, Animal House. And it was Animal House, exactly. And uh, um, so uh, we would be playing gigs, and then all of a sudden, this guy, this big tall guy, Andy Chernoff, right, would come to me and goes, Dude, you're great. You're a great guitar player. You want to start a band with me? I want to start a band with you. Let's start a band. I go, Yeah, I'm looking to start a band, new band. And this guy, I found he's like a rock writer. Right, he has his own. He's his own fanzine called the Teenage Wasteland Gazette, and mm. right, and he's a rock writer, and he has friends in the music business. And oh. some of, some of his friends are Richard Meltzer. Richard Meltzer was a very big writer, and he wrote for Crawdaddy and Rolling Stone and all these, you know, you know. And then, but besides that, he was a lyricist for Blue Oyster Cult. Right, and that he's yeah. friends. Right, so he's friends with Sandy Perlman. This guy, Sandy Perlman. Who is the manager of Blue Oyster Cult all of a sudden? And and Sandy Perlman is also the lyricist of Blue Oyster Cult, and he's kind of like responsible for that image that you mm -hmm. see of those records, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, Sandy Perlman, he goes, uh, oh, all right. So so we, we put the band together, and we get uh, I get this house in the middle of a cornfield in the Kerhonks in New York, so no one would hear us because we were so shitty, and um, I didn't want to I didn't want to like scare anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, you know, it was like we invited our friend Scott Kempner up. So we had Scott Kempner, me and Andy. And so we really never had a permanent drummer. So we, we hired, a, we got a drummer from Poughkeepsie and he would drive this way to fucking come see it. He come to us and his girlfriend would sit in the car in the, in the lot there because she hated our music and um, really fucking hated our music. And um, so, his, you know, we got this one guy and it made it through. We did a, we, and, we did. We worked up some songs, right? Some new songs, some original songs, and then then Meltzer got Sandy to come to see us, come up and see us. So like, Sandy Sandy Perlman comes up to Cahawks in New York to see the Dictators. You know, I don't even think we had the name yet. Right? So he mm. comes up to see us, and the first thing he says after after that audition, he goes, "Don't sign with MCA." But like. Like, like like you had an option, right? I stepped back and I like I looked at Scott and I look at him and go, uh, "We're in the music business, boys." You know, so we really impressed him. You know, and uh, and I know I personally he told me you impressed me more. You know, to me I he goes to me I, I thought I would never find another guitar player like Buck Dharma, and uh, nice, he goes, very cool. I found it. I found it. So Sandy. So it was, a, it was kind of kind of fate almost. The whole thing happens kind of like fate. Yeah. And so Sandy Perlman discovers the dictator. Sandy dis Sandy Perlman discovers Rusty Boss. And uh, God bless Sandy Perlman. Rest in peace, my brother. I love you so much. Thank you for what you did. And um, he brings us to New York. So we're out of freaking Carhock. We're out of Green Acres. We get <laughs> we get the fuck out of Huxley and Buxley. We get the fuck out of there, and we go down to the city. And, uh, you know, we have places to stay. And so we, we, he brings us to CBS Studios. We, we make a demo. And uh, next thing we know, we're signed. 
Nice. I got to go crazy right here. Yeah. All right. That's, that's right. It's awesome, man. That's so right. how, how did the name the Ross the Boss, how did that come about? Uh, well, you know, at one part of my life, I can't stand it. And there's part of me that I still can't stand that name. Uh, you know, it's just not serious. I mean, you know, Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page, they're fair. Right. Yeah. yeah. People, people don't take it seriously, you know. It's just the fact that all, all the dictators had Jewish names. We were a bunch of Jew boys, Jew boy nerds from the Bronx. Right. Yeah. And we were like, we can't, this, our names suck, dude. Ross Friedman, get the fuck. Richard Blum, Scott Kepner, Randy Sheeran, that wasn't so bad. But, so Scott became top 10. I became Ross the Boss because that my, my friends were from playing baseball. I got right. the name. I said, I've been rude. They called me Ross the Boss. So, so it was kind of like, kind of like the, the, the BOC with the nicknames, and MC5 had a couple of nickname kind of things. Buck Dharma. Donald yeah. Roger is Dharma, right? Right. Danny, yeah, you know, it's like, it, it's not a, it's not a. Fred, Fred, Fred it's, Sonic it's, Smith. Right. It's not completely crazy that Jewish people took different names. Like Tony Curtis took different names, and uh, sure. Rick Lancaster. You know, they're all with someone else. You know, they have different yeah. names. Gene Simmons, Chaim Vitz, Paul Stanley, Chaim, yep, you know, yep. or Paul Klein, sure. you know, like, you know, Chaim, you know. Yeah, that's not, those are not rock and roll names. They're all crazy oh, albums. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so we put this, we make this record, and we thought this was going to be the biggest fucking thing in, in, we thought everyone would embrace this record. We thought we were the fucking cat's ass. We're the right. combination of. We're the combination of the Who, Bruce Springsteen. No, no, Bruce. We're the Who, um, the Beatles. We're the Who. We're we're the Flaming Groovies. We're the MC5. We're everything together. Yeah. So it comes out, mm. and no one, no one bought it. Right. Yeah. yeah. But no in hindsight, it. hindsight's twenty twenty. Now it's considered a proto punk, you know, milestone, a masterpiece, and the, and whatever you, the whatever you guys the equipment you were using, it's it's a pretty lethal record like the the guitar it, tone is a monster yeah yeah it's hanging in the rock and roll hall of fame it's uh you know right andrew, w, andrew, andrew wk did remixes of it people cite this record like it, every every band that i've come in contact with with when, when i'm working with the dictator and even when i'm working with metal it's like these people are so reverent of that first record it was a year ahead of the ramones okay yeah one year the Ramones, and we were uh, you know, the three bands that were signed in New York City were the Dictators, Kiss, and New York Dolls. When we got signed, yeah, the Dolls. And, uh, we we put that record out, and it just like it just has legs. It just doesn't people. Well, yeah, you you, know, you guys were a part of that the missing link along with the, the high energy Detroit rock fans, like. MC5 and his Stooges and also bands like Motorhead and the Deviants and the Pink Fairies and you guys were kind of like bridge the gap you know, in the whole plasmatics in the in the whole punk thing so it's really it's pretty amazing um I mean do, do you remember like what you guys what you use in the studio like guitar wise sure. like amp wise and stuff I absolutely do I had my uh 64 SG custom, mm. unmodified, stock pickups. I had a uh, band we bought from Manny's, uh, Marshall Majors with the four inputs. You know, that's I think that's it was before the, the preamps. So you just bridge the sides, you bridge it, and uh, that's all I had. I don't use any effects. I've never used any effects in my life ever. Oh, just straight in, just straight in. Straight Straight in is the rust of us. I guess that's why I'm not covered in all the rock mags a lot because I'm so fucking, I'm fucking boring, man. I mean, <laughs> It'd be a rust, short interview, what, huh? What do you use? Uh, a guitar tuner and a board? Uh, that, that's funny. Yeah. All my, so all my, you, you, all my style ahead. is in, in these hands, in my heart, and in my brain. That's, that's what I, that's my okay. thing. Because before earlier you were talking about song craft and creating songs and choruses, and I mean um, there's some um, Andy 
he has some really amazing songwriting, song crafting, great uh, sing along, you know, great choruses, just just great songs, just great songs. Um, I mean, I have the other. I just wanted to show the southern one here. I have the second one here. Manifest this, Destiny. This is, you guys jump ship. You guys move to a different label, right? Yeah, we manifest to Destiny. Yeah, manifest Electric Destiny. Style of yeah, and um, my friend in particular, my the the guitar player from um, Black Mantha, my friend, he loves the guitar tone on this album. Do, do you remember what you used on this one? Same thing, the Marshall Major, yeah. No, oh, just straight in. Just a half stack. That's it. I think Scott used the Twin Reverb. Okay. There's no effects on any of that, and those that Blood Brothers was live in the studio, no overdubs. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I've, I mean, I've been in studios, and so I know that sometimes a studio can take a life on, on its own, and the sound can take on a life of its own. Because obviously, they all they all sound completely different. The first one is so raw and so, like, you know, primal almost in your face. And um, I think that that's really what grabs people about about the first um, record i mean i mean do you do you guys actually consider yourselves a part of the, mo the punk movement or what, what did you guys think about all that when it all started happening well we were there <laughs> we were right there right the of i mean you well, know, at the yeah, at the very beginning sure, we're playing cbgb's right there and you know we were right there right the epicenter of the whole thing um the california sun on our first record so did the ramones you know we became friends, fast friends with them, the Dead Boys, all these bands. I mean, we knew everybody. I mean, it was like, you know, it would be crazy. So you actually, you actually played with a bunch of punk bands in the in the New York area. That's all we did. That's all we did. Right. Okay. And then we so then we went on tour with BOC, and then that's like, what I was going to ask you because the the Sandy Pearl and Mary Krugman connection. If you guys ever toured with BOC. Oh. We toured with BOC. We played state. We went everywhere. As a matter of fact, the Dictators headlined the Palladium in New York City in '77. And guess who the opening band was? BOC. Nope. <laughs> who? So this ACDC. little band. This little band from Australia. They're called ACDC. Oh. ACDC opens up for the Dictators at the Palladium, and they write about it in their blog, right? And then they pack up. They were like, I like this guy. Look at these guys. They're fucking amazing. Okay, we fell in love with them. They pack up and they and they go to CBG was and play another set that night. I mean, it's a it's a legendary night. Legendary night. It was us, uh, it was ACDC, Michael Stanley, and the dictators. And you know, Michael Stanley is a good guy from me. He passed. He's from uh, Cleveland. But uh ACDC was oh my god. And I go, wow. Scott. I That's start. amazing. And then we and then we, we had to go out to the to Cleveland to open up for ACDC. So we're mm. opening up for them now. And I go, Scott, they're never gonna open up for us again. That's my prediction. <laughs> they will never open up for the dictators again. Goes, well they, oh, they 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 just I mean Bond Bond had that electricity, man. He there was he just captured the stage. Not only did he have the electricity, that band was fucking unbelievable. Yeah, you know, and we became such good friends. They they I, they really loved us, and we loved them. And Malcolm goes, comes. We're in Pennsylvania somewhere, but fuck nowhere. And we're playing the show. We did a lot of uh, uh, dictators, ACDC, Thin Lizzy shows. Dictators, Thin Lizzy, nice. Uh, uh, you know, Cheap Trick. You know, there was a lot of bands that they just kept pushing us out there. So Malcolm comes up to me in one of these shows, and he goes, "Hey Ross, hey what's up?" I go, what's up, Malcolm? How you doing, man? He goes, yeah, yeah. You know this guy, Wingnut? You know this guy? You know this guy, Wingnut? I go, Ma, Wingnut? Who's Wingnut? <laughs> huh? Who's Wingnut? Yeah, yeah. This, 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 this guy, like, that plays a billion notes. This, this guy that goes, like, fucking, plays, like, a million, million notes. I go, uh, Ingve? Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. He goes, boy, I, he didn't like. 
those guys had no, did not have nothing in common with Ingve Malmsteen. I go, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about him, Malcolm, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> he's calling, he's calling Ingve Wingnut. Wingnut. <laughs> Wingnut. Well, all, all those ACDC guys were like, you know, they're from the school of Chuck Berry and and that whole vibe. So, but yeah, that yeah. that's crazy. I didn't know that. Um, that oh must my been, god. So those shows must have been powerful shows. Uh, when you get like a, a Thin Lizzy, uh, uh, Gary Moore, Buster Boss, Angus Young, oh my God. There was some power on that fucking stage. There were some people that knew what the fuck that was going on. We had so many shows. Unbelievable. Well, so so what, what do you think was the funnest band you played with or the wildest band you played with? Oh, the wildest band. Time? Dead boys, the fucking retards, major retards. Um, the dead boys. Oh. Oh. I mean, it was yeah during the during the time of the, the, the punk movement it was. Um, I mean, a lot of people might not realize it, or you know, they probably read about it. I mean, it it was a, it was a kind of a dangerous, you know. It was when music was still dangerous. It still had an edge to it. It still had some real danger to it and those guys brought some real yeah they were pushing the envelope mm. they were pushing the envelope uh, great guy i love Steve baders was a great friend of mine he's passed up you know so we had so many shows and so many memories of, and i can't even begin to, to, to tell you every single memory i have sure but, sure uh, i mean i've been on the road since making records i don't know my discography, almost 60 records or something like that. So what about um, Sid? I mean, when Sid moved over uh, from England to New York, I mean, you were probably around during that time. The first time we went, we went to England in 77 to support the Stranglers, you know, the, strength, the whole yeah. Strangler. Hugh Cornwall sure. saw us, he loved us, fucking loved us. I go, you sure, you, sure you, you want us to open for you? You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So we go on, we go to the marquee. You know, we got, we get in town that night. We go to the marquee to see Sham 69 and Sham 69 and the audience was spitting, gobbing at the fucking, at the fucking van. I go, uh, guys, get ready for this. You know, so, so, uh, the Shanglers are great, you know, bring on the green. <laughs> Whatever happened to Leo Trotsky. He got an ice pick through his head. So, yeah. So we're like, oh, it was insane. Guys were spitting. We were bringing, the guys were coming on stage. Mark Mendoza, we were punching. Get the fuck out. You know, us big New York guys didn't take kindly to being spat on. I don't care sure. what, 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 what kind of shit you do. You spit on me, you're going to, I'm, I'm killing you, bro. Our, our roadies were holding guys up on stage and, and we were just fucking wailing on them. It was, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. We broke the Who and Rolling Stones record at the Roundhouse in London for shows. What? Record for shows. Oh, the oh Stranglers and Big Ted. Stranglers and Big Ted. Yeah. Yeah. We broke their record at the Roundhouse in London. And then, awesome. then and one of the nights, like, we like, these guys are fucking screaming at the outside in the back, in the back, in the back of the dressing room. It's like, we look down, it's like, Mick Jones and fucking Billy Idol, they're like they're like screaming at us to get us in. And we're like, okay, come on in. So we get them in, you know, and Mick Jones is like, you know, first question he owes, like, how's Sandy Perlman as a producer? He's asking me, me, me and Scott, we're like, how's Sandy Perlman as a producer? We go, yeah, he's great. We love him. Yeah, we love Sandy, yeah. Next thing we know. This is produced the clash. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next thing we know, it's Sandy Brown. And it right. was insane. It was an insane that time. Oh my God. So when you went over to England in 77, so were you were you were already familiar with the Sex Pistols and all and the whole punk movement over there? Of course. Yeah. And wow, this this is even crazier. We went to this this hotel in London. Very nice. It wasn't a super super expensive fucking uh, you know, knucklehead hotel. But we went there and like we I walk in, it's like 
fucking Sid is in the fucking lobby. Sid He's is there. He's waiting for us. Oh. He's waiting for us in all the hell's the London Hells Angels too. So the London oh, wow. Hells Angels and then Sid Vicious, you know, so and and like like so me and Mendoza have big Mendoza, Mark Mendoza have a room together. So we're rooming, right? So I take I and he, like, sit, knocking on, like, sit, I, I take Sid and said, what's up, man? You know, and he's like, he's, like he's, want, he's wanting some shit. He wants some, you know, he's, he wants to be around us. And, you know, and so and we had this big fucking Hells Angels, like Bubbles, this big guy, Bubbles, who was, became my our bodyguard. So Bubbles, I, I have Sid Vicious and Bubbles in my room and Mark Mendoza in London, my first night. We're fucking so tired. We're like, what the fuck is this? I mean, it was like, so Sid, you know, so he wanted like we got him a sandwich, a round, a couple of rounds of sandwiches, got him some beers, you know, and he was just like one of these wayward guys. It's just right. Needed parenting. <laughs> but then he ended up moving to New York. So I mean, did you did you ever see him when he did that the residency there in Max yeah. Kansas City? Sure, Nancy, and he was Nancy Spongin, and Andy was with Nancy Spongin. My boy Andy was back here. Was nailing Nancy Spongeon for a long time, and then all oh. of a sudden she, she's with Sid. So I mean, you know, and Arnie Phillips, oh. the Chinese, that's dead. Both everyone's dead. God bless them. Right. Oh, well, what, what what were the shows like when you saw saw him and like when he had that residency there in New York? I mean, was it just? I really didn't go there. I mean, at Maxis because I, I at Maxis takes the slope when the Wayne County incident happened. The guy Peter mm. Crowley just is a, is a fucking twerp. He still is a twerp. Um, you know, he was Wayne County's boy. I don't know, nothing against him now, but they, they, they met, they made up, they kissed and made up. Wayne, Wayne and Wayne in Manitoba. It's under all that's all under the fucking, you know, done now, but you know. Well, back then when the whole thing was I started. Think, I think Sid Vicious ruined the sex business, I really do. I think not. What's because that? I think he ruined the Sex Pistols. I think with uh, Glenn Matlock, I think with Glenn Matlock, the Sex Pistols were a much better band. Mm. They were they were a great band. No, they weren't a much better band. They were a dangerously great band. Glenn Matlock yeah. was a real true musician. Rhythm section, Steve Jones, an amazing guitar player. You know, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, and it was like, you know, Johnny had a fucking just fucking spend all this energy fucking making up for that fucking this guy was a disaster he was a fucking disaster let's face facts mm. Sid was a fucking disaster he was there because the way he looked well right. isn't that, isn't that what McLaren called him a fabulous disaster that's right that's right and he completely fucked the band up and uh you know he left the fucking US tour was a fucking trail of shit all over the country Well, I was I was just about to ask you. So I mean, so that was probably the most infamous. Uh, well, did did you ever get to see see the Sex Pistols over there? No, uh, but I fucking wanted to see that. Right, right. Well, who was the, who do you think the best band was at the time that that you saw back in the seventies, like even before the Dictators or during during that time? Who do you who was like who was your pinnacle at the time? Uh, well, for, for the genre, I thought the Clash were the best band. The Clash. Yeah, with Topperhead and and I and I thought that uh, uh, well, as a, as a guitar player, who as a guitar player, who was your big big influence? Who was the cult? Uh, oh, okay. You know, I was very very. You know, I'm a basic blues guitar player. Very very Foghat was. I loved Foghat. I I love, I love Leonard Skinner and I love Ted Nugent. I mean, those guys could actually play. Right. Hard, you know, you know that was my thing. And, uh, but but Buck Dharma was your guy, huh? I loved him. Oh, I loved to this. I still love. Him. Nice. Yeah, they're actually coming here in a in a few weeks. I'm gonna go check them out. They're one of my favorite bands, so that that'll be very yeah, their, cool. Their management, their management, of course, we are going to manage the dictators again. Because, you know, we have a brand new career we have two two new songs out our third song is coming out 
September 12th. Uh, it's going to be unveiled at the uh, Metal Hall of Fame uh, induction in Middletown, New Jersey. And I'm yeah, the first. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to be there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. You know, so is it. Cool. You all know I'm a first ballot. I'm on, I'm on the first ballot inductee to the Metal Hall of Fame in 2017. And the dictators are going to do some acoustic songs. We're the only band playing. And. Uh, Oh, so you guys are going to be there in-house? We're playing. You want to give me a little background of what's going on with the Dictators now? Like, where you because you, you said you got the um, Al's in the band and you have their management. Yes. Yeah, I will. I will totally give you an update. So the new Dictators is me, Andy, sure enough, the two founding members, Albert Bouchard, our drummer, our new drummer. And he's unfucking. Great. Have you heard the two new songs? No, I haven't checked them out yet. Let's get yeah, the band back yeah. together. And goddamn New York, gotta check them out. They're two. They're on YouTube now, with two videos and two new songs. Okay. I, so I love the song titles. Let's get the band back together. I love goddamn that. Goddamn New York. Goddamn you know, New York. <laughs> our, our city is a fucking crime toilet right now. You know, and all the all the uh, urban cities are crime toilets. And, I was gonna uh, say. I mean, one one of my questions for you is like back in the day. I mean. I didn't go to New York until around 90, 1990 or so. So right. the city itself, I mean, how did that guy influence your, your writing and just being around that? I mean, it was, I mean, because um, cities back then were, were a lot, they've become more gentrified, but they were pretty dangerous back then. Oh, yeah. My neighborhood in the growing, our, our Bronx neighborhood was okay. But, you know, like Stephen Jimmy's neighborhood where the, the bums were, it was fucking an adventure. An adventure now 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 like new york new york is a crime toilet you know chicago is a fucking crime toilet la is a crime toilet san francisco is a crime toilet washington dc is a crime toilet yeah. new orleans is a crime toilet uh minneapolis is a crime toilet portland is a crime toilet uh, it, seattle is a crime toilet it, and they it, all it, have it, one it, it's they like, all have one thing in common they all have well, one thing in common you guess what it is but don't say it now you say it don't say it now Okay. Nance, what's up, brother? What's up? Yeah, they're all crime toilets. So that's what it was. So. And what was well, the impetus to? Oh, oh, what what, what was ahead, the impetus to, to to get the dictators back together again? Well, I said, I mean, when we had the fallout with Manitoba, and uh, it's like this guy's never going to be in the band again. And uh, I'm like saying, guys, I'm going to be play. Why don't we play? Mm. What's stopping us from playing? And Scott said yes. Andy said yes. We we're going to have a new drummer. And unfortunately, Scott was diagnosed with uh, dementia. And uh, just, so it was me and Andy and Albert. And so we're going to have a, we're going to unveil our new guitar player September 12th. And uh, new video, new song. So let's do it. Andy was totally energized. And uh, that's the, how we started the band, me and Andy. So. And what's that's the song? Awesome, Mike, is that what's, the, what's the songwriting process? It, it, you know, do you guys get together in a room or do you bring bring stuff to the, the table? How, how did you come up with the it's, song? It's more, yeah, we bring things to the table and then when we get together, we work shit out. Like uh, we're going to be rehearsing for the, for the acoustic event. Sure, there's going to be a tons, tons of, tons of. Uh, we just shot the video last week in New York, in, New York, in Manhattan, at Smash Studios. So we're gonna, you know, every time we're together, we, we're very, very creative together. So, you know, now, I was going to say, I'm going to was going to fast forward a little bit to um, 1990, and this is an album that you might be familiar with. <laughs> this Manitoba's Wild Kingdom. When my me and my friends had this album every time like on the weekends because we went to school or whatever and we put this album on it was party time we, this, oh, yeah. we, put, we would put this album on to get prepared for party night it was the quintessential party album man and i i love you for make you know making this album and releasing it because it's just just is there I mean, is this so much fun? I mean, it, a lot of people forget that, you know, there can also be fun in music, too, and all of that. It should stuff. be all fun. Right. It's, it's just it's just a great 
fun album, man. It's just a great fun album, and I just, just wanted right. to. All two minute songs. <laughs> They're all yeah. All the party starts songs. now, man. The party starts now, right That's now. Right. That's it, baby. <laughs> uh, you know, I, um, stop that uh, whining. Stop that stop whining. Stop that whining. If you had a bad day, if That's you lost right. some weight, you might get laid. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's, man, it's a silly it's, fun, it's, man. You're the fucking genius. It's oh, awesome. Oh, so I mean, it's like. People, 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 you know, claim that the dictators are stupid. And all I have to say, stupid is our business. Thank you. Stupid is our business. That's right. Oh. We embrace it. Thank you. And stu stupid is our business, and business is good. That's yeah. right. There is. Well, and you guys, and, you guys yeah. actually probably, you probably made some decent money off that record, right? No. It, you know, it was that close. We had a hundred and like. We needed 110 stations for it to go nuclear, right? We're on MCA records. We had a hundred and like 106, right? And Al Teller and Sandy Perlman, Al Teller, chairman of, of MCA, and Sandy Perlman has an argument and like like a, like a cursing out argument, and we're done. We're done on the label. And we're, and we're like, oh. oh man, another that, one of those bad luck. That, we were that close to having a fucking runaway hit with that song. We had a great video on MTV. It was getting played. We had a great song. Oh, That's where I saw it. I saw it on MTV first. That's yeah. where me and my friends saw it. That was great. It was a great video. Yeah. But, you know, listen, don't get me started. I mean, you know, it's like so many things, but, you know. And as I said, I tell my, I tell my friends, greatness is its own reward. How much uh, from from a commercial to make and sense? Find another one, and another, and another fucking another fucking bit of factoid on that record. The 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 guy that mixed that record, Manitoba's Wild Kingdom. His name is Andy Wallace. Andy Wallace, right? I know that Great name. Guy. Yeah, you know what the next record he mixed? Is it Pantera, or nope. was it G GNR? Nope. Oh man, I know that name. Who who was it? There's this little band from Seattle. They have a band, they had this record called Nevermind. Oh. And it was like <laughs> he mixes that record. Okay. He mixes he mixes the next he mixes the Nirvana record. It smells like Teen Spirit. And it's like, whoa, dude. Whoa. Wow, okay. No it went went into the stratosphere. Oh, uh, no more hairspray. Thank you. <laughs> how much from from a business side or commercial side? How much of it is just pure luck? Because, you know, the dictators were proto punk band. There weren't bands like the dictators around. But someone just heard it and said, "Yeah, let's run with it." Same with Manowar. There was no one like Manowar around yeah. at the time. Um, yeah. How much is just the, the you know the the planets aligning and you know obviously the well, music is the music, but you know in terms of blowing up, it's just the right place at the right time with the right riffs. You got to be in the right place at the right time. You got to be at the right place at the right time. And uh, I, it's just it's just a pile of shit. <laughs> it's a pile of shit. So I guess I guess you've sort of been on the lucky side and the unlucky side over the years, you know. I've been lucky. I've been unlucky. I've been blessed, but mostly I've been blessed, and I've been blessed with good health, and that's the thing now. And uh, I'm strong as a fucking. Uh, I'm, I work at this place. I work here, you know, and uh, I'm a workaholic. I work seven days a week. I do business. I do music at night. I do everything that I have to do. There's nothing I don't do. I don't complain. I'm not a fucking, I'm not a fucking pussy, and I don't fucking complain about hard work. I welcome it, and it drives me on. And I'm, I'm sure it's keeping me healthy. I am sure it's keeping me healthy, and freaking young. I mean, come on, look how good I look. Come on. <laughs> That's right. Especially the hair, Ross. Right? Especially the, boss, the hair. Man. I mean, I mean, I'm 67 years old. Look at this shit, man. You look, you look fantastic, man. You look great. Thank you, because I mm. fucking work hard. I, don't, you know, and I'm like, I, I don't complain about it. Oh, I don't want to work. I just have to work hard. It's too much. It's too hard. I'm too hard. I'm too... get the fuck out of here. Stop it. Stop your whining. Go, go lay down by your dish. Stop your right. whining. Go lay down by your dish. It's okay. I don't say these things. 
because you might I'm, get laid, you know, right? Uh, that's right. I'm a happy guy. I, uh, uh, I loved every, all my musicians. I loved everyone I played with. Uh, so I'm so I'm so honored to be to be a part of like guys like the Helicopters and, and guys mm. like uh, you know and so many great guys. So many bands I played with and guested on. Nicky Anderson, right? Oh my God, those guys. <laughs> That's yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a freak for all this stuff, man. He loves MC5. Oh, yeah. He played, yeah. I played on, I played on their records. I got furious and, uh, you know, I played with Wayne Kramer. I Somebody saw the, I, I saw the MC5, well, they were the MC3 in like, like 03 right. or 04. They were fantastic. It was, uh, you see them with it was, was, it was him in the rhythm section of the MC5 plus it's some other, right. other cats. Right. And then the nomads, great. the nomads, and it's, you know so many great bands. And I've been, I've been lucky. I've been lucky. I mean, you know, it's it's been an honor. And, uh, I mean, I'm definitely looking forward to the next incarnation of the Dictators, man. That that's you're gonna love I'm, it. I'm you're actually, gonna love. I'm gonna be there at the the Metal uh, Hall of Fame. I you know I'll be there in a couple of weeks. I'll see I'll see you there. And uh, so you'll you'll see our new song. You'll see our oh new yeah. Member. I'll be able to hang out with you guys and chat you yep. up and that's right it's going to be a great spread, day. spread, spread the word of rock and roll man that's right it's early and you know some people go well how could you be how could the dictators be at a, at a metal function like that i go okay dude let's let's unwind what you just said okay first of all i mean i'm 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 the fucking godfather and inventor of power metal thank you with me and joe man of the war fucking help uh, kind of like invented power metal you know, so I have metal cred, and I, I mean, I was in the first class of the Hall of Fame, in the Metal Hall, okay? First class in 2017. So the, right yeah, then and right there, here. right, right then and there, I think I have enough metal cred for the whole dictators. Not to mention, we have Albert Bouchard, the founding member of the Blue Oyster Cult. All right? right? So they're going to go in next year. I have it. I have knowledge about that. I'm an insider. So... Albert will be in and the list of cult next year. I'm, I'm very angry that they didn't go in this year. But that's okay. They'll, they'll be in next year. But um, so, I mean, the dictators, we have, we have enough, you know, metal cred for everyone. Believe me. <laughs> sure, <dictators>. man. <laughs> Believe you don't me. have to be like a metal, metal, metal band to, to have roots in metal. You, you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, so, I mean, how could you get a metal? I go, I don't metal enough. Yeah, well, like proto metal. Enough, bro. Proto that's metal. That's right. So For sure. that's going to be a, September twelfth is going to be great. You'll see the new video, and uh, you'll see our new member. We'll do some acoustic shit and um, take it from there. You know, everything else is positive, good. Right and because, because of course, you, when you started out in music, I understand you started on the piano. Is that right, or the violin was first? Piano was first, sir. And and am I right in saying that you are actually left-handed? I am left-handed. So was that, given that you play right-handed guitar, was that because of the influence of the violin? Because basically you can only play right-handed, or was no, it just I, a natural way that you wanted? That's the way. I, that's the way I picked it up. That's the way I picked up the violin. You know, that's the way I picked up the guitar. Hmm. You know, my metal, my left hand is just so strong, and it's. Been working for me, and and you also you still play live um, keyboards. I mean, do you like you know breaking out for a you know, song love, or two? I love keyboards. I love my, the keyboards. I love what I did in Man of War. Uh, I play it on stage with RTB band, and uh, yeah, I do love I love keyboards. I do love. It. So, so I, have, I have a friend, my, my friend Joe Hasselvander from Raven. He. He also said he learned how to play the violin when he was young. I don't know if he ever ever uh, toured with Raven or not. No, I know Joe too. He's a very nice guy, a lovely fellow. Yeah, he's a brother of mine, man. He's an awesome yes. cat. Um, yeah, we'll it's just interesting that you guys both play the violin. And he said that he did, when he picked up the guitar, it was like that. He could just play it. That's a. I've never played a violin, but that goes to show you how difficult it is to play. Yeah, you got your four strings. You know, but uh, you learn. You know, and my new my, one of my, my during this whole scandemic, my new instrument was the, the mandolin. So I've been teaching myself 
mandolin. And my dear friend, writer from National Pussy, who I love and mm. adore, and I love National Pussy. And uh, so she's like, she's been schooling me in, in, in mandolin. And she was a mentor on me when I, when I you know, I gotta get one of these. Because Albert had one hanging. I gotta, I'm gonna get me a mandolin. I love the way that sounds. I love it. So I have a mandolin, and I've been learning mandolin. And I'm kind of like, hey, very cool. Yeah. So, so you're going to go like all Richie Blackmore and do something medieval? <laughs> Blackmore's night. It's all going to be I medieval the, folk I, music. I, if I had a wife as good looking as that, maybe, but mm -hmm. uh, that could sing like that. But no, I don't think I don't think people. I, I think I'm doing enough. I think between the Ross the Boss Band, the Dictators, Death Dealer, and Shaken Street, I think I'm kind of. I'm like. I think I, I'm doing it. The only thing that I'm going to do is a blues record. Mm. And you're going to see why I adored Michael Bloomfield and Melvin Bishop and Paige Clapton, B.B. King, Albert King, Freddie King, you know. Are you, are you working on a, um, a book? I no, thought I read but you know what? I, I should work on a book. A lot of people want me to work on a book. I'm going to do I thought that. I read I that. Yeah, I, I got to. I got to. Um, because you never know when I might die. So, I mean, I think that, uh, I'm not gonna die. so I got to work. I, you know, a lot of people want, a lot of people have offered to be uh, ghost writers. So, I you should, I man. Should. You, you should do it. Yeah, I have so many memories and so many stories and so many great memories. Your memory is very sharp. You remember a lot of details and, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. You know, I never clogged myself with drugs back in the day. You know, I did mm. my fair share of cocaine, you know, the Peruvian marching powder, yayo, you know. I, I did a, I did a little bit of that. You know, I must admit, I did that. You know, I had my, you know, I, I did. I'm not, never did, never, never had a drug problem. But I did, I did it, you know, back then, back in the day. Right. But uh, sniffery was never my big problem, never. Never, never, never was a junkie. Never had a fucking addiction problem. Thank God, Mr. Manitoba did. A lot of, a lot of my friends did, and they're paying the price for it with their health, their, their wrecked bodies right now. So I mean, you, know, sure. you all know a lot of people like that. So, but uh, I'm, I'm, thank God, tough as a fucking horse, and uh, keep going every day. I'm driven. Uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I have a fucking have this kind of like this chip on my shoulder like i'm gonna you know it's like i'm gonna get back the dictators a great i'm a big bigger man you know it's like you know the fact that we will never I'm, I'm gonna do it still it's like it still burns in my stomach you know it just it gets me like you know it's like you still have that fire yeah it just i just i go this ain't over yet i told them this ain't over yet right on man right this ain't on. over yet the only way it's going to be over is when we say it's over when we say it's over, when I say it's over, it's not over yet, motherfuckers. Okay, it's not over yet for me, especially. Okay, and uh, I think that's what people kind of like. People, I think people, that's what people like about me because I'm just, I'm not giving in. I don't, I don't give up. You know, it's just like, it's just like this. Those are words to live by, man. I dig that. You know, I don't care. You're old. You're old. Get old. Do I look old? Am I old? Oh, what's all? Well, the important thing is, is can you deliver? And, you know, I saw you guys back in 2019 with Rights Boss, and I wasn't familiar with your work, or, or to be honest, because I'm not a power metal guy, so, you know, I'm not, a, you know, a Man of War fan, but it was one of the best gigs of the year. And, I mean, I know in other interviews, you know, you've been described as a, a festival killer, and, you know, you guys just have a powerful presence on stage live. It's, it's a, an incredible right. experience. And it's a powerful presence. It's an honest presence. It's an honest presence. There's no bullshit. There's no fucking costumes. There's no backdrops. There's no, you know. No pyro. No. I like that. I do like that in the rock show every now and then. Okay. It's just nothing, nothing like a nice explosion, you know. I, sure. I have nothing against it. But but when you come to see RTV Ross the Boss Band, you come to see me, you get the real deal. You get me at 150%. You know, if you want music, that's what you come to see. If you want fucking special effects, go to the Kiss Show. 
you know, we'll spend a hundred million dollars and go see Kiss. And God right. bless him. I love Kiss. And obviously you deliver because you've got such a great lineup. I mean, I, I know that you had previous lineups. How did you pull this one together? Well, I mean, the, the current lineup is, is, I think, the Lost of Us band is tremendous. It's Mark Lopes, lead singer. He's just a great, great durable front man. He's just a fucking bunch of, a bundle of energy. Then we have, I think I have one of the greatest, well, let's go to the drummer, Steve Bolognese. I think Steve Bolognese one of the finest drummers around. I think this kid, you know, if you if you ever study Witherfall, that record, you ever, you ever hear Witherfall? Check out Witherfall. I mean, he's on a lot. He's on a lot of things. Steve Bolognese. I've heard of them. Yeah, Steve Bolognese is an incredible drummer. My drummer is absolutely. At the same time, in the pocket, he's just he's just a killer. He's a killer. He's a killer, and he's a funny guy. A fun guy to be with. And of course, I have. I think. I think I have the greatest bass player in the world in my band. There are a few at his level. Billy Sheen, my buddy. Um, but Mike Lepon, Mike Lepon is right up there with Diesel Butler, John Ellisle, Jack Bruce. As far as I'm concerned, in my opinion, he's, he's that good. Mike Lepon is that good. You saw him play, right? Yeah. He's berserk. He's berserk. He plays with his fingers on like the bass player in that band that I was in in the 80s. He plays with his fingers. Joey plays with his fingers. I think Mike is a fantastic guy. All great guys that will go through anything to play. And that's my my first my first thing is I need warrior. I need warrior spirit. I need I need the guys that will go through anything to play. That's my bet. Go through anything and do anything to play music. That's why we're here. So hopefully next year we go to get to do everything we wanted to do in twenty twenty much as we can do, we're going to do. If you come see us, we're going to blow your brains out. We're going you're to blow you, your brains you, out. What, you're talking about some, some dictators tours? Well, the dictators, that's that's separate. The dictators are going to be amazing. Lost the Ghost Band and Death Dealer. All, all those bands will play. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to have all three tours next year, huh? Good. Let's go. You're rocking it hard, yeah. man. You're, good. You're, you're, you're keeping it real. Keeping it real. I think, you know, everything is going to come to fruition. Okay, well, all these bands, you know, let's go. Let's hope this, this bullshit stops and we can go. But uh, I hope I, I want everyone to be safe. I want everyone to be healthy. I want everyone to be, safe, you know, happy and, you know, but we're going to do some fucking damage. And given right given on. there's a, a number of you in both Roster Boss and uh, Death Dealer, is that something we can hopefully have a double up? Yeah, yeah, that the poss that possibility does exist because uh, uh, three of the of the roster boss members are in Death Dealer now, Steve, Mike, and myself, and so it makes for a better, you know, double bill. It saves a lot of money. And, uh, as you know, it doesn't fall from trees money, so uh, you know it would be two separate things, two separate sounds, two separate things. It's great. So we, 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 we want to do we want to do things like that. No matter no matter any way we can get to the to the public, we're going to do it. Uh, I, I'm hearing a lot of things about you know I'm reading a lot of things that I don't like. Okay, you know what? People are dying. People are they're, they're feeling sorry. Okay, they have they have reason to feel bad. I have no feel I have no reason to feel bad. Is it a bad you know what were we were we handed a bad card? Yeah. A bad hand? Yeah. Okay, but we're back. No problem. Let's go. If you're and a complainer, don't don't be in my band. Don't be in my fucking band. You won't be you won't be there for long. Like ten seconds. And I, I know you you're really keen to get on the road. Uh, I understand you've got some shows books not with Roster Boss, but a special um, array of uh, musicians in Eastern Europe. Yes. And, Yes, supposedly we're going to start that in. in um, we're going to start that in. And it was it was, it was, it was postponed twice. We're going to start these shows playing with local orchestras in in uh, March. Hmm. Okay, so and it's like. Um, let me see. So that's been that's been pushed back to next year, has it? Yeah, it's March. It's been, it's been, it's been, it's been, Graham Bonnet, 
Marco Mendoza, Julie Roth, Doogie White, Ross the Boss, and Mark Lopes. We're going to be playing with local orchestras. Julie Roth, nice. Yeah, 15 shows, 15 shows in Russia, all over the place. Minsk, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, Zarkov, all these places that I can't even pronounce. Rostov on Don, Krasnobar, Mariusky, Yasnuki, Svet, Ogorsk, Volograd, Moscow, Minsk, Kazan, St. Petersburg, Minsk. So we're going to start that in March. Then we're going to do 11 shows in Spain, Costa Bos, the whole full band. And then in May, hopefully we'll do the whole Costa Bos tour that was canceled three times. So with, with those shows, because, uh, you know, obviously there's been a number of bands uh, over the years now that have played with symphony orchestras. Um, who, who was the, sort of the um, the bright spark who came up with that idea? This was this promoter from, from Russia, um, and she's awesome. And, like, she, she proposed it, and I said, okay, we're there. We love it. We love that idea. Imagine, like, Helen Kill with an orchestra. We playing and not singing. You got to be good, right? And it's interesting because, it, you know, it's not just one band or I'm assuming because I don't know what the set list or the, uh, right. the score it's is going to be. be. A, it's going to be at least we do four songs, we do just four songs. Graham Bonnet will do four songs. We do like, I don't know how it's going to work. So it's going to be good. I think it will be very fucking interesting. And, and well, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to the heavy metal Hall of Fame event that's coming up in a couple of weeks. I can't weeks. wait to meet you awesome. guys. It's going to be, you're going to, you're going to be there too? No. Uh, my friend from Melbourne. Steve will be there in spirit. He'll be there in spirit. If he I'm locked up. Sense. I'm if, locked if up. They let you, if they let you out of your house. He's on the other that's side right. of the world. Which is very, very unbelievably bad. I can't believe it. But, uh... Not for the lockdown. That's bullshit. You can't lock. You can't lock healthy people up. Sorry. It all get back to normal one of these days. It's all. It's slowly getting there. So. Yeah. You got to start somewhere. Right. Okay. Yeah. But at least you guys will have the uh, the, the heavy metal hall of fame event. It sounds like a great event coming. Yeah. Up. Yeah. So we'll take we'll take videos. And uh, Mr. Skull will take videos together, and we'll do a lot of things, and uh, it'll be great. Everyone will see it. And it's been 18 months since the last Ross the Boss album's come out. Are you sitting on any new material? Yeah, of course we are. <laughs> <laughs> you don't ever stop. You don't ever sleep, huh, man? You just uh, just cranking it away. We got it. We got. We don't have a lot, but we have like one great song. Well, between that, that and that, that you know, and, and the dictators, man, you, you you have firing on all engines, on the all new pistons. Songs, the, new, the new dictators song is coming out September twelfth, our third song. But Death Dealer, listen to this: we have three albums out, right? We have fourth record all recorded, the fifth record all recorded, and the, and the EP is all recorded too. It's unbelievable. Oh, you're just waiting to drop all this stuff, huh? Yeah, we have it already. We have it already. I mean, Stu Marshall, my, my, my guitar partner, and, and Sean Peck, I mean, those guys just keep writing songs. I go, how do you do this? How the fuck do you do this? I mean, you know, I don't know. So uh, he lives in Sydney, brother. So uh, uh, so that feeling was all set. We have a couple of ready. We're stocked. We're, like, really stocked up and ready to go. And we should we should give your uh, batting cage a plug if for those in New York as well. Yeah, well, I mean, this is uh, we call the Cage Baseball Incorporated, and we're on a sixty-two dash forty Metropolitan Avenue, Middle Middle Village, New York, which is kind of like Central Queens. You know, we're like five minutes away from Williamsburg, where all the the hipsters are, and um, my favorite Chinese food, M Noodle Shop. And uh, well, I might hit tonight because I'm hungry. Talking all this makes me hungry. So <laughs> they, even, they, even, they even gave me the full menu, the real menu. They love me so much. They gave me the full, you know, like, 
sit down menu. <laughs> so, um, uh, Williamsburg is just a You're one of their biggest place. customers, huh? Oh, huge. And uh, so we're here. We've been here for 16 years as a uh, uh, sports facility, and we've been serving inner city kids for 16 years, and we've been getting kids into college. Uh, inner city kids. We, do, we also do cricket here, and uh, uh, very proud of the fact that we've helped so many inner city kids get to college. I have a, we have uh, 16 teams in our in our the Cage Warriors. That's the name of our, our, our organization that my family works at. We work seven days a week at this. That we, we've taken over some big fields in, in Brooklyn. We have control of a lot of things now and. Things are going very well for us, and uh, just because we, we, we work every day, at, you know, and we have just the community and the inner city kids and their best in mind. I mean, we're not making, we're not being getting rich on it. Believe me. You know what my rent is here? My rent, twelve thousand eight hundred a month. That sounds like New York. That's New York, baby. Ten thousand square feet. You know, and uh, my my rent, my landlord is he, he's okay. He's waiting. I haven't paid all this yet, but uh, but things are good. Things are great. We have 190 kids in our program, and uh, you know, what can I say? We have kids. We're helping. You're paying it forward. That's right. good. That's awesome, man. We love. We love our inner city kids. We love them. All of them. New York City boys and girls. So we saw all of them. You know, we have 16 teams and. I spend my life kind of like helping them, <laughs> you know. Every, you know, we want to make money here, but our, our priority is baseball, or, uh, softball, or helping, you know, doing, doing right on. Big standing up for the community, and they need it. They need. They need us so bad. These kids need us so bad, especially after this last year and a half of school destroying them. Mm. At the raw end of the situation, so we're. we're we have college. We, we bring college scouts to us our, to our, 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 our thing we have once a year, and we're getting we're getting kids, young men placed in school, placed in schools, in colleges, for money, and scholarships. So uh, it's just that's that's the kind of thing that makes me very happy about it. Well, thank, thanks for your time, Ross. It's a pleasure uh, catching up. I hope that uh, in the not too distant future you'll be back down under. I hope the um, oh, the, in, the insane uh, uh, policies that we have down here, we can start opening the borders and get say, tours happening. All I can say is M Noodle Shop is the best, and all I can say is that that Australia. I love order Australia. me a general shows. Uh, all I can say is all I can say is uh, Melbourne, Metal Melbourne. So many great friends down there. So Australia, it's going to be amazing the next time we come. We love all you guys in Australia. We know we do. And uh, we just can't wait. We can't wait to start up again. We're going to be there as soon as they let us. And uh, what can I say? Awesome, man. Ross the Boss, thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you for never giving up, man. Just keep keep pushing the limits. Giving up this is not in my word category. It does in those words. Quit, failure, give up, no, surrender, no.
And welcome back uh, to The Realm. Uh, we just saw Espionage. It was one of the best gigs I've seen this year. Um, but unfortunately, the guys are breaking up. Uh, hopefully, it's just a hiatus, not a, a complete split. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, so we, we won't be seeing too much of, more of Espionage. Uh, and I, I have to get a, get a hold of their uh, digital dystopia album. It's fantastic. And at the top of the show, we saw Elm Street um, at the same gig. That was a great night. Uh, the Aftershock Festival. Um, so, Skull, mate, I, I hope you haven't missed me. It's been a while since, since we've done a show. You know, you've been able to sleep You're always with me in spirit, Steve Oz. You're always with me, brother. So you don't always have to be... I don't have to physically see you for you to, to be, you know, be in the same room with me. It's yeah. Like, it's, it's like the force. That's right. You know? <laughs> and, and, and it's funny because, uh, you know, two months ago... I was gloating, you know, we've got all these great gigs in in, in Australia. We've got all these shows oh, re- and you've got I none. I think I remember and... that. Yeah. It's Rubbing a, uh... my nose in it, talking a bunch of shit. And then, and then what happens? Now we have all the shows. That's right, mate. It's, I'm uh, seeing like three shows, three shows next week. Three. Don't, don't tell me who they are though. Three. It's I'm just going fun- to see the Eagles. And then I'm going well because I've always wanted to see him. You know, it's one of those. It's one of those bucket list things. Yeah. And then next Friday, Carl Palmer from Carl uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer has a band because the other two cats passed away. It's uh, Carl Palmer's ELP Legacy. That's going to be cool. And then two days after that, I'm going to Primus plays Rush. Oh, I know you'll be all over that. <laughs> yeah, Primus plays uh, a farewell to Kings, and so me and all me, my Rush friends, and my mentor that I told you about, Izzy, I'm going with him to, to go to that show. So yeah, man, 
all it, it's all, everything's happening now it's just basically back back to normal so you know do, do you, know, you, you guys you guys will get there right yeah in about three years um you know, we, we, to be honest, with fashions and trends and stuff like that, Australia is like five years behind, so I'm not expecting anything to change mm -hmm. soon. Um, do you reckon uh, Primus are going to be sort of true to the style of Rush, or do you think it's going to be more well, their well, own well, well, version? Well, 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 yeah. He's going to be whatever. I don't know <laughs> what the hell. You know, he's a fucking nut. But, I mean, he's playing that album because that was the first album that he heard just like with anybody else the first thing that you hear is what impacts you the most and he wants to pay pay his pay back his respects to the album that influenced him etc cetera, etc cetera. it's fantastic it's um you know i love all the rush it is not my personal favorite but i mean fuck you can't go wrong with any rush so i mean i know every song on the album and i worship it uh for sure but I really don't have no idea what he's going to do. It could be, I was thinking, what if he brings in a singer so he doesn't, you know, sing in his cowboy <laughs> funk rapadoodle uh, music? <laughs> you know, I have, you know, I have no idea what he's going to do. Could, or maybe, maybe Getty will be, will be the lead vocalist, the, the surprise vocalist. He'll wear a bag over his head and no one will know. But I will tell you this, for all the Doom slash Stoner guys out there, interestingly enough, and I don't know if you know this or not, but guess who's opening for them, for uh, Primus Rush? That's right. The Sword is opening. And Wolf Mother from Australia. Are they That's making the heard. trip? That's wow. what I heard. Okay. Maybe he lives in LA. Maybe he lives in the states somewhere. I know he's an Aussie. Aussie no, cat. They, they they had they had shows book a show booked in July in Melbourne and it was postponed to August. So maybe they are okay. in the states, but um, they had shows booked in Australia. So yeah. So and, the Sword and Wolf Mother is open, which is kind of a weird bill, but hey. I've never seen the sword or wolf mother. So, I mean, it's a win, win it'll be and you know, and then Primus is playing Russian when they're done with that. You can just leave. You don't have to listen to the rest of the Primus. I'm just kidding. Cause it'd be a wacka, 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 you know, you know, cowboy funk -a doodle, whatever. I'm just kidding. He's an amazing musician, but, um, an acquired taste. Yeah, it, it is. It'll frizzle fry your brain for sure. No doubt, you'll sail the seas, seas of cheese. Um, and we've got a couple of albums that uh, may fry the brains of people who are looking for good music and may not be familiar with them. And so I'm, I'm pulling. I know my ones a little bit more. Oh yeah, in the, in, the, in the spirit of the Ross the Boss interview, proto metal, proto punk. We were going to go with with that theme. So. Or I, I was, and it was an amazing interview, by the way, that guy, I mean, so much energy, and, uh, so just so full of, uh, just so full of energy, so many ideas, just, just, I don't know, man, he's just, he's, just, he's just so full of music and wanting to like, you know, full, full of creativity and all that stuff. He's really an inspiration and a super, super cool guy. Yeah, and I, I've got the opportunity to meet the guys when they were out in Melbourne in 2019 and just absolutely really nice guys, you know. Yeah. Uh, and Ross, you know, after the show, he's at the merch stand signing albums and whatnot and mingling with the fans. I mean, they're, they're you know, genuinely um, good. good well, he, lo he loves the music for sure, man. I mean, he's been doing it for 45 plus years and, you know, he's been, he's just never say die. That's right. He is one of those kinds of cats, which is awesome. So, as I was saying, we're going to talk about a couple of albums that uh, we like that perhaps people may not be familiar with, or I've got a feeling some people may be familiar with your recommendation, Skull. But um, the one I've got this week is, um, again, it's a band out of Russia, and it is called Master, and it's pretty much spelt the same way in Russian, so 
it's not hard to figure out the letters. But um, uh, the reason why I picked this is in Russia, there's a band called Aria that is kind of like the, the Russian version of Iron Maiden. They're that big, mm. melodic, oh. powerful, heavy metal band. They were formed around beginning in the 80s, so maybe maybe a couple of years after Maiden. Uh, and, and they're huge, like they play stadiums and whatnot. Um, and a, a few of the guys who were originally in Aria uh, left the band and formed Master. And this this is back in 87, because, you know, I like my mm. um, 80s metal, the glorious 80s. And That's right. Don't you the... forget it. <laughs> and this this is their first album. This is a, from 87. And it's just a, a great thrash metal album of that era, mm. that classic. It's um, thrash then. Yeah, yeah, but it's a classic metal. I mean, I don't care whether you call it thrash nice. or just call it heavy metal. It, it's metal. And great vocals, uh, great riffs, great solos, just great everything. I love the production as well. Um, so if you're looking for something that, you know, it's just, you, you love your old school metal. Of course, as I said, Ross the Boss, um, Born of Fire came out last year. Fantastic I'm excited album. to hear that. I'm really excited to hear that. that yeah. Ross the Boss. Because as, as you said, with, with you know, if I go back to, 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 to the Ross the Boss album, uh, you know, the, the hooks... Uh, as you said, we're in the choruses, and that's where you go. Oh, yeah, that's power metal. But if you just listen to the riffs in in a lot of the verses, it's just old school New York heavy metal. Right on. So, and that's why I love it because it's a little more grittier. It's not the I'm going to pick up my sword and go across the oceans. You know, it's right. not that kind of thing. It's got a bit more grunt to it. You know, a bit more of that New York attitude, I guess. Um, but sure. this this master album is just a, a classic album. So check it out. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, your your one may not be quite as obscure. I think some people may have heard of this band before. Maybe a few, but I figured, you know, if we're going to talk about, you know, punk, you know, we we're, we're going to say like the motif was like, you know, around uh, dictators, the beginning of punk and proto punk and all that. I was like, if I'm going to go, you know, go talk about this, I might as well go big. And so, I mean, as when it comes to punk, you know, obviously the proto-punk, the MC5s and the Stooges, and of course the dictators, you know, of the world, of course. And when you start talking about punk punk, you start talking about the Ramones, which is considered, you know, one of the, you know, ultimate punk bands of all time. I already showed you the, you know, my dictators collection. So, I mean, and I couldn't, I couldn't find the first, Ramones album. I know I have it on cassette in my room somewhere, but this is one of my all-time favorites is uh, Rock is to Russia. And of course, I'm going to cheat here a little bit with the Ramones Mania. I just wanted to show you these. But so you could e you could easily go with the Ramones, but me pound for pound and just song for song and just just the impact, the unbelievable impact that this band, the singular band had on the entire movement and this album in specific, is it's unquestionable. Um, so they're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, whatever that means to anybody. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of people might even be able to guess what it is. But for me, probably the greatest, single greatest punk album of all time and i'm sure a lot of people might know my friend kevin uh blake is going to agree with me he'll, <laughs> he'll wholeheartedly agree with me on this is and drum roll please is of course sex pistols never mind the bollocks i mean there's really might need might, might not be any surprises here but like i said just pound for pound I mean, the album is a monster. Um, everyone knows now, people didn't know it back then, but now uh, you find there's like, there's the guitars, there's like a bulldozer effect on the guitars because he, because there was some, not everyone was like in his studio working at Ellen everything at the same time. And so there, Steve Jones had some downtime with, with the engineer, with the producer. So he decided just to, layer layer after layer after layer of rhythm guitar that created this unbelievable 
bulldozing wall of sound. It's just, it's just a monster. It's a tsunami of sonic power. <laughs> it's just, it's just, in a, you know, in a, at the time, it, you know, in hindsight, when we look at it, you know, everyone calls it punk or whatever. It really, it's rock, of course. And I think that's where punk came from. It's just an amazing revolutionary milestone in music. Um, and it's obviously, I consider it probably the single greatest punk album of all time. And it, and it probably definitely probably needs to be up there with at least within the greatest albums, maybe top 50, top 100. I don't know. I mean, I know there's a lot to go through, but I mean, you know, God Save the Queen, of course, Anarchy in the UK, Problems. Oh, this this particular copy is the one that has the submission sticker on the back. Some copies didn't have submission. Some of them came with like this poster that's mega, mega rare now. Uh, some of them are yellow. The, the orig or earlier ones are orange or day glow orange like this one. Um, you know, and you know, it's funny that Ross, he told, he brought up the fact and, um, you know, everyone glamorizes Sid, God loves Sid, poor guy. He, he was, uh, you know, like a fabulous disaster, like um, uh, Malcolm McLaren said. Um, and he did become a role model for a lot of disaffected, affected youth. But Glenn Matlock was the real kind of him and Steve Jones were kind of the musical backbone of the band. And when Sid came in, it, it just became, um, it really embodied, it epitomized what punk was and the chaos and the anarchy of what punk was and what it became. And he became, he literally became the, Sid became the image and the poster boy for what punk was. And, you know, for good or ill, Sid, when people see Sid, they know what punk is you know who he is and you know what punk rock is i mean he he was um yeah he he, he was just a walking like chaos machine essentially but that's for me that i will say i know there's very few people out here watching this ladies and gentlemen that don't know what this is hey but if you don't know this album i highly recommend you go listen to it like right now you do like these so, obscure bands like sex pistols and rush and <laughs> and whatnot you'll have not to everyone dig up knows something who they are man so like i said do it now anyway so yeah that's it the sex pistols man um i know you have a copy in your collection no actually i don't have a lot of punk albums so oh no. well, see there you go you need it in your collection, my friend. I'm not. I'm not huge into punk. I. I, th I think I literally my... said if there's one album, punk album, it sh would be this one in your See, collection. I, I, I'd I'd lean more towards the exploited, particularly the Beat the Bastards album because it just sounds metal, but it's a punk album. This right here this, you're trying to so I, I i won't be able to convince you will i now the exploited are awesome too the uk subs it just started but now you started getting into db you know um early clash and you know punk 77 uh generation x but they definitely that they call that the second wave the second generation punk that's uh um and of course gbh which is one of my all-time favorite uh uh you know d beat style you know second second wave punk bands but from punk 77 from that period this is the one in fact now i know where to get you for christmas because your <laughs> cd collection is desperately lacking um it's crying out for this record to complete your collection and sp speaking um, of speaking of punk um i'm not sure if you saw i dropped uh tsol live show from tokyo on the channel very cool i'll we'll be show. checking that out for sure and, and um as i said i'm not a big punk guy but um they've got some really great songs yeah that would be the early 80s a california hardcore style but that's for sure that's awesome um 
Well, do you have any other input on that? Because we'll be moving on to our next segment. It's um, the great gig in the sky. It, the great gig in the, gig in the sky. We'll take a little bit of a somber note here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we do. We'll, we'll do this. Unfortunately, it looks like we will, we will be do, having this segment more and more often because it's just the way of things. But we, we wanted to take the time here just to um, recognize a couple of the giants and two different scenes. Um, I'll just start off with Eric Wagner because um, he was a giant in the Doom scene. Um, it, you know, I don't know if you have any input. I have a I have a couple of things that I just wanted to say if you. But you can get it started if you want, or I can just go ahead here, Steve. Well, do do metal is one of those styles that if if you're into it, you're into it. If you're not into it, it's it's invisible, like it's unknown. It, it's almost like the occult. Mm. You have to be in a secret society. And so if you've if you're into doom metal, you would have heard of of Eric, and you would have heard of Trouble and the Skull, etc. Uh, and obviously, Trouble. You know, with with a you know that's your personal uh, taste in music or not, you can't deny the influence that it's had on doom metal, that band. Oh, a absolutely, and um, yeah, I mean, in fact, I mean, they had the true the musicality and the chops and the riffs to back it all up, and they were one of the first bands that were embracing the Sabbathy style of music there was only a handful at the time that were doing it there was a couple over in england like Witchfinder general and pagan altar which was very very obscure at the time and then over in the states there was um saint vitus pentagram which was <laughs> pretty obscure but both saint vitus and pentagram were pretty relatively obscure at the time even though they had releases um but I would say in a really in a, in a, the obsessed too. But they were even more obscure because they they had had and didn't have any re releases out. They had one track on a Metal Blade comp, I believe. But believe it or not, Trouble might have been more the most visible out of all of those bands because they were on Metal Blade and they had released a few albums on Metal Blade. They had Psalm Nine and The Skull which I have in the room on CD here. I wasn't able, I couldn't track them down in the, by the last minute, but I do have, um, I do have this here, Run to the Light on Metal Blade. And you know, the funny thing is that it was, it's doom metal. Oh, and I can't forget. Oh, I almost forgot Candle Mass. Sorry, Candle Mass. Obviously, Epicus Doomicus, but you know, um, as far as the states go and like the doom metal goes trouble was probably the most visible and the most well known because they were on uh metal blade but um they you know they were doomed they they fell under they called themselves white metal you know because they, they you know along with sabbath sabbath a lot of their uh songs were cautionary tales about saying hey we're not saying we're not saying you should do this or that we're saying watch because if you do do this this can happen xyz can happen and so they they um obviously had that you know that kind of label as being white metal but they were basically just ca cautionary tale bands basically saying you know be careful out there you know don't do you know hard drugs or you know or whatever because you know bad things can happen um but so they were considered doom, but there there was also a lot of hard rock influence from the 70s as well. Um, that's a great album. Um, this is a great album. Of course, it's Trouble, uh, Manic Frustration. This is their second album on uh, Deaf American. Obviously, I'm saving the best for last, and this is a fantastic record. Um, but, you know, once again, pound for pound, I mean, note for note, this is an absolute crushing masterpiece. Now, people would call it, it is doomy, and it is there, people would fall under the moniker of doom, but it's hard rock, and his voice is, you know, he has his own uh, unique voice, his own unique sound, incredible vocalist, great lyrics, stunning rick rubin production um 
this came out around the time that Danzig, you know, he was, you know, there was like these rock bands, if you will, on de the Deaf American label. And this was one of them and they played on, you know, I saw them on that tour. I, luckily I got to see them a couple of times. Um, and my band Black Manta actually got to play with them as the skull at that, at the, the same uh, Doom Fest that you came and filmed, so graciously filmed us at, Steve. Um, they played, they played that festival, as you know, the Doom Fest. And anyway, he will be missed. Um, it's really tragic. Um, apparently there was COVID related, uh, you know, illness. He didn't have the shot or anything like that. It had, it came out that he did not want to get it for whatever reason. Um, and because of that, um, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, but, I, I heard I heard that um, all the band members were infected, and I think all the other band members recovered, and unfortunately he didn't. So, um, well, I know, think, yeah, Ron like... Holzner apparently did have the shot, and so he recovered. And some people, I don't know, but he definitely uh, he was you know I think he was um, famously he was a smoker. He he liked to smoke his cigarettes and party a little bit, and. I think he was in that demographic where it probably would have benefited him to get the shot. You know, it's a, it's a personal it's a choice. It's up to everyone. But if you fall under those kind of that type of demographic and he was a little bit older, obviously you want to err on the side of caution and it probably would be, you know, so anyway, that's a tragic loss for the doom scene. I met him, chatted him up, super cool guy. Once again, uh, he'll be legendary for all time, influencing the burgeoning doom scene from the early 80s. And just uh, this, just 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, will be considered one of the greatest doom <laughs> albums of all time. Is uh, un Unarguably, is, cons is one of the greatest doom albums of all time. Um, and so the, we'll move on from that to the next one this this is a really big one and uh we're kind of um switching gears here but we were talking about charlie watts earlier and ross the boss minute mentioned him as well i don't know how much how well you know the stones or any of any of that uh, i am familiar obviously with their classic hits so i wouldn't say i know the discography all that well i did see them in right. i think it was 1995 or some, sometime around the mid '90s, they played the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Uh, the stadium mm. holds the stadium holds a hundred thousand people, but I think um, that show there may have only been about sixty thousand or something like that. Uh, wow. To be honest, I didn't really like the show because I hate stadium shows. I hate. I, oh, I hate, you went? Yeah, I went. I went. But uh, as I said, I hate. I hate those big. Wait, who'd you go with? That, personal. Tell me more. Tell please tell me more. I've never seen them. I can't, I can't remember. I, I can't remember whether I went with my sister or my father. And so uh, I, my, my seat was, because you know, obviously there was no pit that you could jump in and jump right. around, not that you would for a stone show. Um, but I was probably uh, at least 50 metres away from the stage. And so yeah. it was an interesting experience. It was great to see them, you know, see them live. But, you know, I, I'm the kind of guy that likes to go to a dive bar and <laughs> get right up the right. front of the stage so it was a very different experience but it was good it was good to at least see them live and that was you know 95 yeah, yeah, 95 they 95 they were still you know that it's not like they were you know getting out of their walking frames or anything like that they were still they you weren't know, fossilized yet yeah they were they, they were still rocking it um definitely live so uh that that, that was great in terms of just at least having that experience. I, I don't know That's that there'd cool. be many bands that I would be willing to go to a stadium show, but, you know, I think at least once in your life you should, you know, try it out in front of 60,000 people yeah, and, cool and see one of, the, your... one of the one of the great all-time rock bands. Yeah, they're, they're arguably one of the... them, the, the Beatles, The Who, I mean, they are arguably one of the single greatest rock bands of all time. Um, and I never saw The Beatles, I must admit. Yeah. <laughs> right. Maybe on the rooftop, right? Yeah. Apple, yeah, the Abbey Road rooftop. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, obviously we're talking about Charlie Watts uh, passing away, huge blow for the rock industry. And, um, you know, he was older, he was 80. He lived an, an amazing, amazing life. Um, he was quite the dapper dresser and, uh, and he was a pocket drummer, you know. Um, I used to famously say that I hated the Stones. I mean, during my metal years as a young man, an angry young man, it was easy to hate the Stones and it was easy to hate the Beatles, you know, those, you know, those hippies from the 60s or whatever. But in the nine, late 90s, early O's, because I, mean, I everyone grew up hearing that music on the radio, so it was easy to hate them. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then you start listening to them and like, wow, these music, these, there's a reason that these songs are, uh, you know, legendary, you know, that, you know, that instantly recognizable and you can sing along to i mean then that there's their masterpieces and that they will stand the test of time for all time is like you know i mean the stones and the beatles you know just amazing songwriters and um so i can, came around over the past 20 years i have now i'm not a fanatic but i definitely have come around on the beatles and the stones as being just just absolutely you know um just just absolutely like vital to the evolution of everything that where that's going on right now metal you know it it all it just evolved from all of the those, those very humble beginnings of the beatles and the stones all the way up to the 80s with metallica and slayer i know that sounds bizarre that to put those to connect those two but that all evolved slowly over time and so over the years, I have I've really have gotten to really appreciate uh, bands like that. I've never had a chance to see them. I am going to see them this year. I'm like, well, I got to check them off the box. These motherfuckers aren't getting any younger, you know. I, I um, think I think Mick Jagger's um, a little thinner than uh, Vince Neil at the moment, so it might be okay. Yeah, I don't. I just. <laughs> I know, I, you know, I'm not trying to sound callous or harsh or anything, but it's like, you know, uh, we don't live forever. We wouldn't, you know, in the afterlife, we will, or the great beyond, the great gig in the sky. But some of these gentlemen are, are getting aged. And so I really would like to see some of them. That's why I'm going to see the Eagles, you know, a great American rock band. Why the fuck not? So, um, and um you know my tastes are all i mean i love metal but i love it's all also important to understand the history of rock and where it came from and how it started for me i love history and i love the connections of of how it's all how it all happens and how you know so that's why in the chamber of the cosmos i have records from all genres um you know just just to understand music and the evolution of it and all that so i'll just say I'm just going to throw this up here because he's actually on the cover. There's Charlie himself. Get your yayas out. He's hopping around and having a good old time. Amazing live record. Um, and there's his his drumming mule. You see he's carrying his drums around. Um, and then I got another really cool one. This, this is actually, I would have to say, probably, probably my favorite Stones album. Um, her... Uh, her satanic majesty's re uh, request I always get that mixed up um, but yes it has it has the 3d cover on it um, he is known for being a pretty you know he's a jazzy guy and he was always kind of in the, a pocket kind of guy but this out uh, this there's a song in here called 2000 man that has quite the bizarre uh, beat I uh, I don't, you know, I'm not a drummer, so I can't even tell you, but it's not your 4-4 four, four beat. It's kind of um, very atypical. So we just wanted to talk about those those couple of uh, individuals that have been lost to us that are now all in the great gig in the sky. So just wanted to, um, it's always that we have to recognize the, the genius of, of these individuals and the people that are that are passing on to the great gig in the sky. So. Just wanted to share that, my friend Steve Oz. And you know, although maybe a bit somber, I think it's also an opportunity to celebrate what they've left behind. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, I think we wrapped up another amazing uh, episode of yep. Rip Crew slash The Realm. 
Um, it's good seeing you again, my friend. And we'll be doing, I'll be going, going to the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame. Be running into Ross the Boss and all those guys there. Now that it's been established that they will actually be human beings there <laughs> instead of a TV screen to stare I at. I, I don't know. They might be like holograms, like the Dio hologram. Right. You know. Um, so I'm, I'm, so now I'm excited about that. Um, but I think that might be it for me, my friend. All right. Great seeing you, Skull, and uh, look forward to the next show. All right. Well, remember, look to the stars, carry the torch of enlightenment and strive to be a disciple of rock and roll in the Brotherhood of Orpheus. Rock and roll. Yeah. When the time